Hello and welcome back to a fantastic afternoon of Pike Online Education Track. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Katie Bell uh, to the stage, our virtual stage. Um, Katie is going to be talking about real Python made of blocks, um, which is a fantastic thing for any Python to be made out of. Um, uh, I'm not at all biased because I've been playing way too much Duplo uh, with my kiddo. Um, but Katie, uh, I have a fantastic bio here of Katie, which she gave me full permission to add some um, uh, made up facts, spurious stats into. I, I haven't taken her up on that opportunity, but who knows? Uh, so let's see. Katie's 10 year career as a software engineer has been pretty darn fun. I, I love that. I love it. Uh, she helped develop Google Docs and later was on call for some of Google's biggest cloud infrastructure as a site reliability engineer. She's held some serious technical and operational challenges at Campaign Monitor uh, as the lead engineering uh, productivity team. And she helped get at the education startup Grok Learning off the ground as their first employee. Represent. Uh, today, you'll find her freelancing for startups as well as working on her own projects. Um, uh, more recently, she's been teaching programming to beginners for a long time and is now an instructor at General Assembly. I am super, super excited to hear this talk. Katie, tell me all about blocks in, in my <laughs> new favorite thing. Well, I'm not going to start off with blocks. Um, i start off talking about myself. Uh, I've been teaching Python for a while, as mentioned. Um, mostly, I was teaching high school kids. Uh, more recently, I've been teaching Python to adults as an instructor for General Assembly. And anyone who's been teaching coding to beginners will know this, that coding is hard. Coding is really hard. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to go on in your brain while you are doing coding, while you're writing code, and while you're reading and understanding and debugging code, there's a lot going on. So if you are an experienced developer, you might not realize just how hard it is for beginners. So let's go through a bit of an example. Uh, here's a little Python program, uh, it has a while loop, uh, and it asks repeatedly to, for the user to type in, what did you roll, as in a dice roll. Uh, and if you type in you know, what, what dice rolls you got, uh, it tries to keep track of how many sixes you've rolled in a row, uh, and when you reach three sixes in a row, it stops asking and says, that's three sixes in a row. And if you understand Python and you understand all of the syntax and everything that's going on, uh, your brain can focus on what these variables are and what they're doing. It actually takes quite a lot of mental capacity to sort of step through and go, okay, I start the program, the sixes variable is zero. Okay, if they type in a six, then that adds one, and now the sixes variable is one. If I type in another six, now it's two, but if then they type something else, then it's it's not six, it resets sixes to zero. And if they type in something else, yep, it's still zero. Okay, if they type in a six, that's one. If they type in another six, that's two. Okay, and, and then it's three, and then that stops the while loop, and then it prints a message, okay? Reading code <clears throat> means keeping all of this like variable state uh, in your head, as well as following the, the way that the program is executing. If you are a beginner to code, it's really hard to even think about those things because you're too busy trying to remember all of the stuff that's going on in the code. Like, what is a variable? Like, why is this print but not with a printer? What do the quotes mean? There's parentheses, there's equals and, and double equals, and they're different, but like, why does equals not mean that the things are equal? It's actually changing something. Oh, I forgot. The the colon and the while and nothing works and the indenting's wrong uh, and it gets really quite a lot. Now if you happen to be a high school student in your seven or eight and you're maybe 12 to 14 years old uh, then maybe you can't even think about these things because just using a computer is taking so much of your brain or your reading and spelling actually takes quite a lot of concentration um, or even typing and finding where the colon button is on the keyboard is hard enough already and it is just too much uh, for your brain to cope with at any one time, right? This is called cognitive load. Uh, you have a limited amount of working memory and when you are learning new concepts and absorbing new ideas, you need to be storing that information in working memory until you can build it as a long-term memory and a long-term skill. So your brain is working really hard to try and learn a lot of new things at the same time. And this is part of what makes learning to code really quite difficult. Uh, so we don't teach kids to code or anyone to code just all at once. 
you break it down into steps. Oh, and you might have not noticed that even with thinking about all of those different things, there's still a bug in the code where if you run it, it never actually finishes. It never prints three sixes in a row, no matter how many sixes you get. And then trying to figure that out is another step that's really hard. Um, and it turns out to be because this input returns a string and we're comparing the string to an integer uh, and the code doesn't actually do what we expect it to do. So this is all really hard and too much stuff for your brain to keep track of at the same time. So we break coding down in two steps. We don't try and teach code all at once. We don't throw large amounts of code at the students and we don't get them to build really complicated programs right from the start. You start with hello world. You start with simple variables and ifs. You start with programs that have just text input and output before you try and deal with things with graphics. You can build it up step by step. Uh, but this is a little bit demoralizing and frustrating, right? Learning to code from scratch, it takes a long time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort just to get to the point where you can build mildly interesting text input output programs. Um, and it's really hard to build up enough Python skills to be able to actually build all of the cool and interesting things that you can do with Python. You can build web apps, you can build games with Pygame, uh, you can build cool things with MicroPython, um, and you can analyze data and make interesting sort of scientific analysis out of it, right? Using NumPy and SciPy. But actually getting to the point where you have enough Python skill to do that is a slow and frustrating process. So again, we don't teach things uh, in that order. Most students in primary school uh, nowadays are starting to learn coding uh, in a simpler way first. Instead of starting with hello world and building up the syntax step at a time, you start with something like Scratch. Scratch is much, much easier for students to pick up at first, right? You don't have to remember the syntax. Uh, you don't even have to remember what uh, blocks are available to you, what functions and what components are available to you because they are all listed there and you can go and find the ones that you need. If you're not sure what a block does, you get very immediate feedback to try out that block and see what it does. Uh, you don't need to keep in your head all of the things that the program is doing because most of the things that the program does are, are visual things. You can see where the cat is moving across the screen. Uh, you don't need to keep in your head, you know, what the X, Y coordinates are of the cat. Uh, but more importantly, you get to build cool things. You can build games and things that you can show off to your friends and coding is this uh, empowering experience where you can solve problems on your own, where you can discover things on your own uh, and build cool things uh, very, very quickly, right? It still works as a step towards building other coding skills. If you learn uh, how variables work and how ifs work and how loops work in Scratch, uh, in theory, it should make it easier to then move on to Python text-based coding uh, and let you build uh, cool things there without having to learn quite as much new stuff at the same time. But what I find in practice is even after learning Scratch, this gap is still really, really big. You go from building cool games in Scratch, and when you start off with Python, it takes a long time to get to the point where you can actually build interesting and cool things in Python. Um, you need to build up the syntax, the control structures, the variables, the data types, uh, and then learn functions. And then you can start to look at all of the cool things that you might build. Now, there are some exceptions to this. MicroPython in particular lets you start to do, you know, blinky LEDs very quickly. Um, but for most of the cool things that you might want to build with Python, it's actually really hard to get there. And it's hard enough that in my experience with most uh, teachers, it's really hard to do that in the year seven and eight curriculum where you're expected to teach general purpose programming languages or text-based programming languages. But with the limited amount of class time you get and with the skills that the average you know, year seven or eight student has, it's really hard to get all of your students to the point where they can build something cool and interesting and exciting uh, in text-based programming. So how do we bridge this gap? How can we take students that were maybe already excited about building applications in Scratch? And Scratch is already quite difficult to, to build things in, right? Because programming is hard. Um, but how do we bridge that gap so that they can start learning Python and building cool things in Python um, without it becoming this sort of slow and frustrating experience? Now, I'm not the first person to try and do this. 
uh, by any means. Uh, Blockly is a really great tool for this. Uh, we saw in Renee's talk this morning uh, that building MicroPython programs with Blockly is perfectly uh, feasible. And this is much easier for students to get started with. They can see the blocks that are available to them. They can build programs out of blocks. It avoids typing, it avoids syntax errors, um, and it avoids that process of having to memorize all of the things that you need to be able to type to be able to write a program. Um, it doesn't quite go far enough to make it really a smooth transition into Python. If you learn to code uh, some things with Blocky, it does, Blockly, it does help you get towards uh, writing anything else in Python, um, but it doesn't quite go far enough, or at least as far as I wanted it to do. Uh, and so I decided that I wanted to build something else that would be another attempt at trying to bridge this gap. Um, something where it's easy to get started, it's easy to pick up and start using it, but it is a smoother transition to go from there into text-based Python and a smoother transition to go on to build all kinds of cool things with all the full flexibility of what Python can do and all the cool programs you can do once you learn to code. Uh, so I call this project Sploot Code. Uh, it is a work in progress. Um, it's currently under construction, but all of the things that I'm gonna show you today are already things that work, uh, things that are real that you can write real Python programs with. Uh, so let's talk about what we are aiming to build uh, with Sploot Code, what I am aiming to build here. So the four things I'm aiming to solve, right? One, it needs to be really easy to get started, it needs to have low cognitive load. You don't need to learn or memorize or, or comprehend a lot of things to get started and start to write your first programs. I also want it to have a really smooth transition into text-based Python as much as we can. It should also have really fast feedback and the ability to write code and iterate and see what your code is doing um, without having to learn how to use a fully featured debugger. Uh, and it should also have uh, as close as possible to the features and flexibility that real text-based Python has um, and make it as unlimited as it possibly can be. So this is a pretty ambitious set of goals. I've not achieved all of the goals uh, yet, uh, but let's take a look at the first one and see what we've got so far. All right, so I'm gonna play a video. Um, so on the left side here, we have, like in Scratch, a set of all of the blocks uh, that we can use. Um, it's not a complete set, um, but most of the blocks that you need to get started are there. Uh, and we can drag and drop them in and we don't need to type any of these things. Dragging two blocks in lets me run my first uh, Hello World program, or I could edit the text, make it actually a Hello World program uh, and run it again. Uh, and this is all happening in the browser. It is running a real true version of CPython in the browser uh, to be able to do this uh, really quickly. Uh, so we can build up a program with a combination of drag and drop uh, and typing uh, and enter you know, interactive stuff uh, in the terminal there. One of the key differences between this and uh, other block-based languages is that the way that you do mathematical expressions is uh, more closely related to how they work in maths class or how they work in regular Python. Uh, you assemble a maths expression just with like numbers, variables, and operators, um, just like that. Uh, it has uh, order of operations, uh, same way, again, straight up creating Python code here. If you don't remember how to type the star to do a multiply, um, you can also type the word multiply, or you can even type, work, type the word times. Uh, in the same way, if you want to use later, less than or greater than, and you don't remember you know, which symbol does that, you can just type less than or greater than, and it will autocomplete uh, to find the thing that you're looking for. All right, so you can assemble uh, by writing text. Uh, so you have a cursor, you can move the cursor around with uh, the arrow keys uh, to find where you want to enter things and just start typing to enter things in with autocomplete. But if you don't know what to type, you can just go and find the block and drag it in. Um, things like uh, nesting and indenting all just work kind of the way that you would expect them to work. Okay. And now we go to the next slide. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so it avoids like most block-based programs, it avoids all of the common problems that really uh, hit students at the beginning uh, with syntax errors. You cannot write these syntax errors. You can't write a single equals by accident because it will order complete to a double equals for you. Um, and you can't accidentally kind of 
assemble the programs in ways that don't make sense. So the one of the frustrating things with text programming is that you can just type anything into the text editor and 90%, 99% of the things that you could possibly type will be invalid programs, right? Whereas not so with block-based uh, editing, most of the things that you can put together are valid programs. Not all of them, uh, but the vast majority. Okay, so that's how it is to get started. Uh, it's easy to write valid programs. It's easy to find the pieces that you need to put together to write valid programs. Um, but as for a smooth transition to text-based Python, uh, the fact that you can navigate around with a cursor, that you can enter the code by typing with an autocomplete, um, it means that you get used to this idea that I can just type code with the keyboard. Uh, it takes fewer keystrokes. It takes less uh, weird punctuation characters that are hard to type. Um, but you are still typing in code into the editor in the same way. Uh, it looks and feels closer to uh, the way that text-based code what looks and feels uh, in a regular editor. So here's an example of um, one flavor of Blockly. There are, Blockly is quite flexible and you can make it look as more or less uh, like Python uh, as you build it up. Um, but I find that the, the split code one in the middle is a sort of closer representation to the way that uh, code works in a text editor. It's obviously not exactly the same, um, but the way that you edit it and the way that you write it is very, very similar to a text-based program. So if you were to learn to code in Python through the split code UI, because it reads and feels and writes in a very similar way to text-based Python, um, it's a not more natural transition into writing Python in a text file. Um, you wouldn't need to learn how operators and the order of operations works, particularly with things like and and or. You wouldn't need to learn how the control structures work with indenting or the different kinds of data types in Python or the Python functions and libraries that are available to you. The only part you would really need to learn uh, is the detail of the syntax and which punctuation characters mean which things. You'd also need to learn string escaping because adding quotes into a string in the split code UI doesn't need escaping. So to get that uh, transition into text, the only parts that you really need to learn are just those parts that are very specific to writing in text and writing with syntax. So all these kinds of errors um, are things that trip up beginners a lot, but if you were already familiar with how ifs work and you were already familiar with how strings work and variables and functions, um, it is easier to learn the syntax than it is to try and learn the syntax at the same as time as learning everything else. Okay. Moving on to fast feedback and iteration. Uh, this is one of the bits that I am the most excited about. One of the nice things about Python and one of the reasons that we like to teach Python is because you have this very fast feedback with the Python REPL, right? You can type in some code and immediately see and find out what that code is doing. You can type in a little bit of maths and find out what the calculation is. Um, in my experience, the students might use this a little bit at first, but they very quickly stop using it because it is a difficult context switch to make from like writing code in a file and running it to writing the same code over again in a REPL just to try it out and experiment with it. And they don't really use the REPL very often, even when it would actually help them figure out what their code is doing uh, in a much more uh, real time kind of way. And actually making that transition into the REPL and away from the text code uh, is difficult, uh, even though the REPL could be really useful. Uh, it also involves typing out your code again a lot of the time uh, when you're struggling with typing even into a text file. The idea of typing something and then it, you know, it's it's gone immediately is uh, is a little frustrating. So with uh, split code, I have added in a system uh, to essentially make your code act like a REPL all the time. So to see how this works, I'm going to write an example program where I am asking the user to type in the temperature in Celsius, and then I am converting it to Fahrenheit. It's a relatively straightforward program, um, but we'll see how it's still easy to get it wrong in Python. So I write a little bit of code, uh, and I run it. I type in the value 40, uh, and I can see that my Celsius variable is now set to 40, right? It's got a little bit of text here that tells me uh, what it's actually doing. So I start writing the next part. It remembers that I typed in 40, and it continues to write the pro it continues to rerun the program with the last text input that I gave it. Um, but I can see here that as I'm just starting to calculate the Fahrenheit, 
Uh, my Fahrenheit variable is being set to 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, right? And I can immediately see, wait a minute, that's not right. There's something wrong here and start to investigate. Now, instead of kind of going, instead of the student then going, what the hell is going on? Um, they can look at what the code is doing and go, oh, um, maybe I've seen this before. Maybe this is something specific I can look up or ask the teacher about. Um, this is a string and the Celsius variable was a string and a string times a number repeats that string over and over again. Um, so it's very obvious what's going on. And notice that I can do this and I can see what's happening and I can see what the bug with the program is without having to add print statements anywhere or go into a step-by-step -step debugger to be able to find that. Um, so if we keep going, we can set the uh, Celsius variable to like the int version of the import, or we could use a float if we wanted to support floats. Um, and now I can immediately see that that has solved my problem and I can continue writing uh, the calculation for Fahrenheit. So I calculate it, plus 32, Okay, 104, that actually seems like the right kind of uh, number that I'm looking for for Fahrenheit. Um, and I can print it out uh, in the same way. Maybe I'm writing some more stuff and I find that uh, because I cannot add a string and an integer, um, I get a type error. Um, this error is easy to, easier to identify because it puts the error right next to where the line is uh, that caused the error. So I can go, all oh, right, yep, the Fahrenheit. I need to convert that into a string. Okay. Uh, so now I have a program that works uh, in the same way. If I have an if, um, and I want to say if it's if the Fahrenheit temperature is greater than a hundred, then uh, print like it's really hot. Now again, this whole time since I started writing the program, I haven't hit the run button once. It has continually uh, rerun the program uh, every time I've changed it so that I can immediately see the effects of any changes that I make to the code. Uh, if I change the, the if, then I can immediately see that the result of the if is different and whether or not that line of code has been run. Now, this is great for uh, lines of code that are only ever run once. What happens if you have something like a while loop where the code is run again and again? Uh, and so there's a solution for that too. Um, if you have a function, uh, it can show you maybe this function was called multiple times uh, and we can see that uh, what is going on when I run this function. Now, when I run it automatically, I do put a limit on how many iterations you can do because it's all too easy to accidentally write an infinite loop. Um, but when you run it manually, it doesn't have any limit on the iteration. So you can still write an infinite loop uh, and see it going until you hit stop. Um, but I can see here that like my while loop ran 100 times. And if I change it to add 10 every time, it only runs 10 times. Um, and this is, again, I could see what was going on without having to print anything to the console. But if I do print stuff, I can also see uh, what the output of my program is uh, immediately as soon as it's run. Uh, okay, so here I can play around with the variables. Maybe we start at a different one, a different number. We start at 500 and I can see that it only runs 500 times now. So you get very immediate feedback on what your code is doing uh, and how your code is operating uh, without having to go through that whole uh, process of like writing a bit of code, running it, writing it, running it. And uh, me as a teacher constantly telling my students to run their code more often, to build it up little bit by little bit, uh, and also to add more print statements if they're struggling to figure out why their code isn't doing what they wanted it to do. None of those things that would be necessary anymore if they could get that kind of real-time feedback automatically. So this last part, uh, real Python with no limitations, um, as you can see, at the moment, it only does text input and output, right? And that's not a, not really good enough. It really needs to do something exciting, um, which it doesn't do yet. That part is still under construction. But uh, the code is as close as you can possibly get to real Python code in the way that the operators work, in the way that you can do like dot to get um, attributes or methods on an object. So here we can do um, a variable dot upper to get the uppercase version of it. Um, we can do replace. We get the same errors that we get from Python. Um, it does uh, everything in the same way that Python does it because it is literally writing and running Python code. Um, so aside from adding some more features into the syntax, um, it's not dependent on having a specific block built for every kind of function that you might want to use 
because the blocks are built in a generic way that you can call any function or you can call any method uh, or attribute on an object. So there is more work to do to support lists and dictionaries, to support functions and classes, um, but it should be possible to just say, I can do an import and I have full access to the standard library. Um, it should be possible to do third party libraries um, and other things where uh, you can just use all of the flexibility that is out there in Python uh, in your code without having to write text Python uh, to be able to get that kind of flexibility. So that's the goal. It's not there yet. Um, we'll see how we go. So these are the four goals uh, that I am working towards. Uh, I want it to be easy to start, uh, have a smooth transition to text-based Python, have that really fast feedback and iterative process to writing the code so you can immediately see what your code is doing um, and to have it be uh, the full flexibility of being able to write Python um, rather than being a, like a walled garden of only these blocks are available to you. Uh, the next steps of the things I'm going to be working on, um, there are some sort of things that make the editing process a little bit uh, tricky or confusing at times. I'm going to smooth out those. Um, I'm going to add cloud storage uh, and the ability to share your code. This is particularly important for remote learning. Um, but more importantly, I really want to add the ability to build meaningful and interesting programs that are engaging for students uh, in high school and things like building a Discord bot or some data analysis and visualization or 2D games um, or the ability to write MicroPython or CircuitPython code. Um, I would love for you, if you are a teacher um, of any kind, to tell me what it is that you think your students would be most excited about building. Um, and I can focus on those kinds of programs first. Um, so please do reach out to me. I'm very contactable because um, I want Sploot code to be uh, something that does entirely bridge this gap where you can start on Sploot code um, when coming from a block-based language like Scratch uh, and where you can build interesting and cool things with Sploot code and build up an understanding of how Python works and how programming works um, and make an easier transition into Python or other kinds of text-based coding. Uh, so that's what I want to build. Uh, thank you. And uh, if you would like to know more, uh, there's a site, splutcode.io, where you can sign up to the mailing list. Um, but please also reach out to me in the chat. Please DM me on Twitter or send me uh, send me messages. Anything anything goes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I there, I've collected together some of the amazing comments from this chat. We, we have like two minutes <laughs> for questions, and there's no way we're going to get through all of them. Um, this one is the highest, highest voted one. Can Sploot use type hinting features to help autocomplete be more contextually aware? Um, so I was hoping that autocomplete would be good enough with just the runtime information. If you happen to know that a variable is of a particular type at runtime, uh, that makes it possible to get all of the autocomplete help that you would get from type hints uh, without actually needing to write the type hints in. Um, adding type hints would make the syntax quite a bit more complicated. Um, we could potentially in the future add type hints into the syntax, um, but I'm hoping that for most students, the ability to build interesting things without type hints um, will be made a lot easier by having that real-time uh, runtime feedback uh, as to what your, you know, why do you need to know the type of your variable when you know the actual value of your variable at runtime? Yeah. Cool. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, more questions. I'm just going to race through them. Could Split Code easily use MicroPython? And uh, with a bonus question, a simulated device in the browser could show what a device might do. And if a real device was connected, it would be possible to run on the device. Would this maybe be possible? Uh, it is maybe po possible. It's all a matter of like how much we can get the browser to do. Um, getting that feedback out of the MicroPython system might be a little bit trickier than it is to do with just Python running in the web browser. Um, but I would love to have it work with MicroPython, um, with MicroPython simulated in the browser. That would be really awesome. Which possibly leads into the next question that I'm massively going over time and I'm going to be booted out in a minute. Um, is Split Code open source? Can people contribute? How can we support you? Oh, I would love to have support. Um, so Split Code is not technically open source. I am hoping to make this into an actual product at some point. And so it is not under a completely open source license. It is under a slightly different license. That being said, the code is all up there on GitHub. 
uh, under a license, it will become open source automatically after a period of years. Um, Fantastic. Please do contribute to it, but you'll have to agree to a license. Excellent. Uh, and I imagine they can contact you by the means on this Twitter to find out more if they have questions. Um, there are a number of other questions. Oh, can Splute Code also output Python or other language syntax so the user can see how their program would look in the actual language? Yes, I am planning to add a feature where you can see the Python code that is generated. Uh, it should also be possible to edit said Python code and bring it back into Splute Code. Um, in, in as many times as you want to. Um, that is a feature once Splute Code supports much more of the Python syntax than it currently does, though. That is very shiny. Okay, there are a million other questions. I'm going to throw them over into the yep, hallway in chat. The hallway thank chat. you so much, Katie. That was fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next up, after a short break, uh, we have 10 tips for teaching technical topics from Tom. Uh, stay tuned for more alliteration. Um, Katie, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Fantastic. I'm so keen.